Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week we've got a new species of prehistoric bat that was already capable of echolocation, a newly named dinosaur species, evidence of very ancient interbreeding between humans and Neanderthals and more. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the journal Animals has looked at the preferences of pet dogs to food or toys. The study let these domestic friends of ours pick between their favourite toy or their favourite food and found that 9 out of 10 times the dog preferred the food over the toys, which the study refers to as leisure items. The study also concluded that food was more likely to function as a reinforcer than toys for training certain behaviours in domestic dogs. This study's findings can therefore be used as evidence to show that training a dog with food is more effective than training a dog with its favourite toy. A simple but interesting story about some of our most loved domestic friends. In other news, the Hubble Space Telescope is still revealing wonders about our universe, as an image was released this week by NASA of not just two, but three interacting galaxies. Interestingly, this image does only look like two galaxies interacting. The one at the top of the image is called NGC 7734, whereas the lower is NGC 7733. Now, the third galaxy can actually be spotted in the upper arm of NGC 7733 as a cluster of different colour than the rest of the arm. Despite this looking like part of the NGC 7733 galaxy, astronomers have analysed this section of the image and noticed it has a considerable additional redshift, meaning that it is almost certainly a separate body to NGC 7733, as it's travelling in a different direction overall to NGC 7733's rotation. Whether or not these three galaxies are destined to fully merge and become one is still somewhat of a mystery to scientists, who have not yet been able to observe this process over many millions of years. It may yet be the fate of our own galaxy, as our closest galactic neighbour Andromeda is due to collide with our galaxy in about 5 billion years in an event that probably won't be quite as catastrophic as it initially sounds. Altogether though, a fascinating image and discovery from Hubble, which is still pushing beyond what we thought possible for it to observe. First up in the paleontology news for this week, there's been a new species of prehistoric bat named. Called Violasia Saigi, it's 50 million years old, dating to the early Eocene epoch, and so it's very close in age to the oldest bat fossils known to us. This new species was discovered in southwestern France, and it's known from an almost complete three-dimensionally preserved skull, as well as other fragments of skulls, mandibles, and various bones from across the skeleton, representing at least 23 individuals. This association of so many individuals in this limestone cave deposit therefore suggests that roosting behaviour had evolved in bats at least by the end of the early Eocene hypothesised by the paleontologist to perhaps have been driven by global cooling that occurred around this time. The three-dimensional, uncrushed skull of Violasia also shows many anatomical characteristics that allowed the paleontologists to work out where it's placed in relation to modern bats. As it turns out, it's positioned just outside the crown group, meaning it diverged before the ancestors of all living bat species evolved. This prehistoric bat was a capable flyer, showing all the skeletal features needed Needed for it, and amazingly, it also had the specialised anatomy of the inner ear that suggests it was able to echolocate. This echolocation would have been laryngeal echolocation, where ultrasound is produced in the larynx, indicating that this ability evolved outside the bat crown group and is therefore ancestral to all living bat lineages. This is particularly interesting because there's a lineage of living bats called the pteropodids, which are traditionally known as the mega bats and include the fruit bats and the flying foxes and they don't use laryngeal echolocation. There has therefore been a lot of debate among scientists as to whether laryngeal echolocation evolved once in the ancestors of living bats and was secondarily lost in pteropodids or if it independently evolved twice in living bat lineages. Either way, the paper explains that Violasia confirms that laryngeal echolocation was present in Eocene bats and so hopefully it can help answer the debate. Also in the recent paleontology news, there's been the naming and description of a new dinosaur species. Called Ampelognathus coeni, it's a new kind of small herbivorous ornithopod and was discovered in late Cretaceous aged rocks in Texas. 
The name Ampelognathus means grapevine jaw due to the discovery of its jaw in the spillway for Grapevine Lake in North Texas. The fossil material known for this dinosaur comprises a single, almost complete, left dentary, and it has many anatomical features showing that this was an ornithopod closely related to Iguanodontia, as well as the very latest Cretaceous Theskelosaurus. The geological formation it comes from, the Lewisville Formation, preserves a very diverse terrestrial fauna that lived on the ancient landmass of Appalachia. But before Ampelognathus, no small ornithopods had been found here, representing a conspicuously vacant ecological niche. So the discovery of this little herbivore fills in this gap in the ecosystem and helps to better our understanding of the terrestrial environment at this time in the Cretaceous. Also in the recent news, there has been a couple of interesting Neanderthal genetics papers. The first one compared an 120,000 year old Neanderthal genome from the Altai Mountains in Siberia to the genomes of 12 diverse populations of modern indigenous peoples in sub-Saharan Africa. Looking for areas of these modern genomes with similarities to the Neanderthal genome, researchers found that the regions with similarities, which were present in all of the studied populations, actually resulted from a migration of anatomically modern humans out of Africa and into Eurasia that led to human Neanderthal interbreeding about 250,000 years ago. So the reason for the similarities in the genomes is due to around 6% of the sequenced Neanderthal genome actually being inherited from anatomically modern humans' ancestors. Additionally, the modern African populations show between 0 to 1.5% Neanderthal ancestry, indicating that a more recent migration of anatomically modern humans from Eurasia and back into Africa must have occurred, carrying some Neanderthal ancestry in their genomes and bringing it to certain African populations where admixture occurred. So, in other words, Neanderthal and anatomically modern human gene flow was bidirectional and multiple migration events of anatomically modern humans must have occurred out of Africa. Interestingly, the study also finds that modern human alleles were deleterious to Neanderthals, as most of the modern human genes in Neanderthals were found in non-coding areas of the genome. This means that the modern human genes were likely being naturally selected out of the coding regions of the genome, since the genes were probably detrimental to the Neanderthals' fitness, something that's also seen with Neanderthal genes in modern human genomes. So although we were interbreeding a lot, over time both species were working the alleles of the other out of the genome, an indication of speciation in progress. So it's a really fascinating study that tells us a lot more about the movements of ancient human populations and our relationship with Neanderthals. And that we had many relationships with Neanderthals. <laughs> The other recent Neanderthal genetics paper has looked at the patterns of distribution of Neanderthal ancestry among human populations over the last 40,000 years, to see if the variations in different geographical regions can be explained by expansions of certain human populations. Modern East Asian populations have higher levels of Neanderthal ancestry than European populations, which seems unexpected given that the currently known distribution of Neanderthals is focused mainly in Western Eurasia, and various hypotheses have been proposed to explain this. While this new study has looked at the paleogenomes of Eurasian populations, finding that the Paleolithic hunter-gatherers in Europe did indeed have higher proportions of Neanderthal DNA in their genomes than populations that lived in Asia. But then during the Neolithic, this proportion decreased coinciding with the expansion of populations of Anatolian farmers across Europe. These Neolithic farmers had less Neanderthal DNA in their genomes, and so their mixing with European populations therefore resulted in an overall reduction of Neanderthal DNA in European genomes, causing the gradient of Neanderthal introgression across geographic space that we see today. It's another fascinating study, again showing how complex past waves of human migration were, and illustrating the effects that a population expansion can have on the genomes of modern people. That's it for the news this week, but before I go I wanted to say a really big thank you to everyone for the really kind comments and how welcoming everyone's been. It's been wonderful joining the team and I hope you enjoy my videos. I'll see you soon.